James 5, verse 13. James 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the ill person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being and even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and he did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Let's bring ourselves to the Lord and ask him to preach to us this morning through his word. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for these words, Lord. Thank you that they are so encouraging to our souls. And some of, some of these souls, our souls gathered here together this morning are tired and weary. So I pray that you will refresh us with your word, that these will really be life-giving words that will wake us up again, give us strength to stand as soldiers of Christ and fight the battle of faith. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I have to ask those of you who have been in the evening service last Sunday to bear with me for a while. The verses that I'm going to focus on will be verses 16, 17 and 18, but they are so closely linked to the previous verses that I cannot skip verses 13 to 15. You will have to look at them. So, I'm sorry, I'm going to give a short summary of those verses um, for those who have not heard it so that they can see the link between those verses and what we are going to discover from God's Word this morning in verses 16, 17 and 18. What we should have picked up from these verses that we've read is that in every one of them there is the word prayer. Prayer is the topic of this passage. It is mentioned in verse 13, if you are in trouble, pray. It is mentioned in verse 14, if you are ill, pray. Verse 15 refers to the prayer of faith. Verse 16, pray for each other. And the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Verse 17, Elijah prayed. Verse 18, and he prayed again. What is this passage about? Prayer. This passage is not about healing illnesses through the anointing of oil or through the prayer of super faith or a super pastor. This passage is all about prayer. And we can understand why. <coughs> because these words were directed to believers who were suffering tremendous trials. Trials that strained their faith and drained them spiritually. They were mostly Jewish believers who fled Palestine. You can read of that in Acts 7 and 8 during a persecution. They settled in the Mediterranean where they faced trials of various kinds and where their faith was tested to its limits. They suffered temptations, temptations that these pagan cultures um, exposed them to persecutions from the, these pagan cultures and from their own people. Much economic hardships too. And as a result, they started to doubt their faith, chapter 1, verse 6. They gave in to worldly temptations. It just got too much for them, chapter 1, verse 13. And they got angry with one another, chapter 1, verse 19. And they became afraid to live in obedience to God's word because they don't know what's going to happen when they start doing that. Or they were afraid of what was going to happen to them when they start living the word of God, chapter 1, verse 22. In the process, they neglected the poor and the destitute, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. In the process, they failed to love their neighbors, chapter 2. They had trouble taming their tongue. You can just think when these things are happening and you get together, People are talking and maybe starting to point fingers and saying bad things about one another. 
And they started to copy the world instead of Christ. They started to look at the world and see, ah, oh, this guy is doing good, and maybe I should join his society or um, his workplace and compromise a little bit on the pagan thing. They got so stressed out that they fought and quarreled with one another. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, you can check there for yourself. They got so distracted by the world that they stopped praying altogether. Chapter 4, verse 3. They slandered each other. They became impatient with one another and unreliable in their witness. Their trials were affecting them emotionally. As you can hear from the stuff that I just brought to your attention from this letter. Socially, as you can hear how they have difficulty relating to one another. And most of all, spiritually, as you've heard, they struggled with prayer, they struggled with loving their neighbor. So James, in order to get them back on track, standing strong in faith again, urged them throughout this letter to stop doubting, chapter 1 verse 6, to be humble, 1 verse 9, to trust the word by doing it, 1 verse 22, to help those in need, 1 verse 27, to love one another, 2 verse 8, to act on what they believe, to tame their tongues, to rely on the wisdom of God's word, to submit to God, who alone could lift them up, chapter 4 verse 10, to live and plan according to the Lord's will, and not their own, chapter 4 verse 15, or the world's. And trust in Christ's return when he will deal with these people who were persecuting them. And to imitate Christ in being patient with one another and being obedient to his word and honest in their dealings with one another. Chapter 5, verse 7 to 12. And the last piece of advice that he had for them was, in order to be patient and to endure and to stand strong in their faith, Pray. Pray, pray, pray in every verse that we've read. James reminded them that through prayer they are comforted. That's one spotlight that he shines on prayer. Another spotlight that he shines on prayer is this, that they will be restored in, in spiritual strength again. And the third spotlight that he, sh that he shines on, on prayer is this, that they will have pure fellowship with each other. And the fourth one, that's the way that they and us and we rely on the power of God. Prayer. So quickly, last Sunday we looked at being comforted through prayer and we looked at being restored or revitalized by prayer. So I'm, I'm going to blast through this so that you just get the gist of where we are going and how we ended up in verse 16, which we will focus on in a bit more detail. Through prayer we are comforted, verse 13. And he asks the question, is anyone of you in trouble? Trouble meaning, is anyone in difficulty? Is anyone experiencing difficulty? Pray. What do your spirit need for comfort? When you are in difficulty, when you are in a difficult situation, when you are in trouble, pray. You pray to the Lord. It is through prayer, this is the second spotlight, that we are restored again, that we are revitalized again, that we get energy to put one foot in front of the other in our walk of faith. Now, James says later, in verse 14, reads like this, Is anyone among you ill? Let them call all the elders. We have to quickly understand something here. That word ill in Greek is the word astheneo. Astheneo. And it can mean sick, but it also means weak, like feeble. And many times in the New Testament, that word astheneo is used to refer to being weak in faith, spiritually weak, weak in flesh, in flesh because of the difficulties of life, having no strength to continue. You can read that in Romans 4 verse 19, Romans 4 verse 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 9, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10. And I think James had that use of astaneo in mind here. Because his whole letter, that stuff that I brought to your attention about 
what was going on in the lives of those believers came from verses in this letter, one after the other. They were going through difficult times. They had troubles. They were in difficulty. They were down and out. He was not refer referring to being physically ill here. It's an unfortunate translation there. It is more like weak, spiritually weak by all these circumstances that they were experiencing. He was saying something like, are your troubles draining your faith? Can you relate to that? Are you spiritually, emotionally, yes, even physically weak because of the trials that you are going through? The disease that you are struggling with or a loved one? Are you in need of encouragement and strength? And now comes the next part. Are you in need of new energy to stand up and walk the walk of faith, to be restored and revitalized by Jesus Christ? What shall you do in that situation? If you are this soldier on the battlefield and you have been knocked down and you are tired, your situation is catching up with you, you don't know what to do, you don't even have enough strength to pray to God, what do you do? James says, call the pastors. Amazing. Call the elders. That's one of the ministry of the elders, of the pastors. Those who are in spiritual oversight of the flock. When new deacons were chosen in Acts, two ministries were highlighted for those um, apostles. Preaching and prayer. This is a ministry of the, of the elders, of the pastors. Call them, let, let them pray over you. Let them minister to your weak and troubled soul through prayer. And let them anoint you with oil. I must tell you, I didn't walk around with an olive oil bottle in my pocket when I go visit somebody in the hospital. Why not? Anoint here, is, or anoint with oil is just one word in Greek here. Aletho. Aletho means to anoint. In fact, if you translate it very literally, it means rubbing with oil. So, no, I'm not going to do that. Not going to come with my olive oil bottle and rub Josie's big ankle with olive oil. Aletho is the key to understand this correctly. That Greek word, aletho, because it refers to the everyday mundane use of olive oil. Like after a bath, to rub your body with it. Like treating skin conditions which they used it for in those days. They mixed it with wine to treat wounds in those days. Even athletes used it after they partook in whatever event to, to soothe their sore muscles, they would rub themselves with olive oil. Th this refers to the mundane use, everyday use. That everybody had olive oil in their homes and this is what they use it for. So how shall we understand this? Again, we have to take note of the context in which James wrote these things to those people. We have to remember that James was addressing those who were spiritually weak, emotionally stretched to breaking point, not people with sore muscles and dry skin conditions. He was giving advice for the hurting Christian soldier on the battlefield. So within that context, listen carefully, what should be applied to the weary and tired soul that would mean the same to it as oil to an aching body? You catch that analogy? James says, prayer. Let me ask that question again because it, it puts things in context for us a bit. What should be applied to the weary and tired soul that would mean the same to it as oil to an aching body? James says, pray, pray. Anointing here, aletho here, refers to God's soothing, caring, healing ministry to the weak soul through prayer. By the pastors, the elders, in the name of the Lord, he says. That means 
as the Lord did it, as Christ did it, to say and do what Christ would have said and done in that situation, ultimately to minister Christ to that soul in trouble, that soul who are going through difficulties. Now, if we do that, if we minister Christ to that hurting soul, if we apply oil to you in your weakness through prayer, James tells us the following in verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith will make the ill person well. The Lord will raise them up. This will cause the weak and troubled believer to get well and strong again. Raised up and energized again. Fully restored to spiritual health again. And if sin caused those troubles and difficulties, because you have heard quite a few ugly things about, about these guys, what they were doing to one another in, that, in, in those churches. If sin caused these troubles and difficulties through the prayer of faith and confession, this is dealt with too. And forgiveness will be given by God. That's the last sentence of verse 15. If they have sins, sin, they will be forgiven. So what do we see here at the end of verse 15? If we look at this person who started out as one in trouble, whom the elders came to visit, who, the, where the elders prayed over this man or this woman and applied God's soothing care for, uh, over that soul and for that soul. And that person asking forgiveness for the wrongs he did, the sins he did, and God restoring him, God forgiving him. What do we see? We see a soul fully restored and healthy again, ready to do God's will through prayer and confession. This should happen individually, as James had pointed out so far, but also corporately, in the body, in the local church, which is James's next emphasis, the next spotlight that he shines on prayer. That this should not just happen individually, it should happen, but not just there, it should also happen within the local church among each other. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins, and verse 15 has ended with that, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Prayer and confession sustain healthy fellowship. That's the third spotlight that James shines on, on prayer. Prayer and confession sustain healthy fellowship. He starts with the word therefore in verse 16. Therefore. In other words, in light of what I've just said, in light of what you've heard about when, when you're in trouble, call the pastors, let them pray over you, let them minister Christ to you, let them minister to you through prayer, confess your sins, in the light of that, don't just stop there individually, do that with one another as well. In the light of what I just said about being restored to full spiritual health again, and being forgiven of your sins, deal with sin in your relationships with each other as well. Verse 16. You have the elders praying over you, ministering to yourself, you confessed your sins, now go and do the same in the church. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other, so that you, you, can be a healthy spiritual body too. Don't hide your evil. That's it. A literal essence of confessing your sins. Don't hide your evil in the context of the local church. If you have sinned against a brother or a sister, go and confess. Go and ask forgiveness. Don't hide your evil. Some of the troubles James referred to here in verse 13 were, you'll pick up the words, I've mentioned them in the beginning of the service. They were fighting with one another. They were slandering. They were quarreling. They were full of hypocrisy. They were full of covetousness, they were impatient with each other and dishonest with one another. So yes, they sinned against one another. What is the proper response to deal with that in the context of the local church? Confess. If you've sinned against a brother or sister, confess. 
That's the proper response. It's like a, having a festering wound that needs to be cut open to get all the dirt out. If not, it will stay there and it will affect the whole body and the whole body will get sick. The cutting open in the church context is confess if you've sinned against another. Ask forgiveness if you've wronged another. He's, James is urging the churches he wrote to, to get rid of what is dividing and hurting the body of Christ, the local church. And the way to go about it is to expose sin, to cut open the wound so that the dirt can get out and the body can get healthy again and be healed. By so doing, the spiritual health of the local church is ensured. What is the preventative medicine to avoid that which makes the local body, the church, sick and ineffective? One is confession. Listen to how Jesus highlights confession. Please turn with me to Matthew 5. Matthew 5 verse 24. I'm going to read from verse 23. Sorry. Um, Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you are suffering, oh, forgive me, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. It's a well-known passage. If there are unforgiven sins, both ways, in our lives, it will affect our worship. It will affect our relationships with one another. It will affect our relationship with the Lord. One of the things that happened with these guys that James wrote to us, that they stopped praying. Maybe their consciences tro troubled their minds so much that they stopped trusting in other stuff. So what shall we do when we have sin in the local body? Confess and ask forgiveness. Why? Because confession leads to forgiveness, to reconciliation, to healing, to peace and unity with one another. I'm not saying you should hang out your dirty laundry here. This is not, this is not what James had in mind. The context he wrote this in is people were slandering each other. People were quarreling. So you guys who are slandering each other, you guys who are quarreling, go and ask forgiveness. Go to that person who, who's done you dragged through the mud and go and ask forgiveness. Confess it. In that sense. An army cannot win if the soldiers are fighting one another. <laughs> Such an army is weak. Being united with one another, caring for each other, loving each other, confessing to each other and praying for one another are grace gifts of God to help us stand strong in our faith, individually but also as a local church. So get rid of that which hinders loving each other. Get sin out of the way by confessing to those who have sinned against and pray for one another, James says. Pray, pray that there will be healing so that, the, so that spiritual restoration can take place. So that you can be spiritually whole again and healthy as a church too. The flesh is weak, so pray for each other to stand strong all the time. Lift each other up to God. Pray for the sick, the weak, those in need, those who need help, those who are struggling. You say, where, where, how do I know who to pray for? How can I do that? We have this. That's handed out. This bulletin is handed out to you every Sunday morning. If you open it up, on the first page you'll see prayer requests. Are you praying for these people? We've mentioned their names. A praying church is a healthy church, just as a confessing church is a healthy church. 
We pray every Sunday morning we come together, we pray for God to work His ways and His will through and in this local church. Keep on praying for one another, James is saying. Lift each other up when you hear of a brother struggling or a sister who is in a difficulty. Bring that person to God in prayer. Pray for those who are in the trenches of the battlefield with you. Pray for those who have sinned against you and need strength to be lifted up again and restored again by God. Bring them to the Lord for His special care and attention and protection to not fall again, but to stand strong. Pray for one another. Prayer and confession are, the two, are two of the means of grace that God has given the local church to preserve its spiritual vitality. But we do not pray for each other because it's just a Christian thing to do. James says, we pray for each other because the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. There at the end of verse 16. So who is this righteous man? Who is he? It's the believer. Those who have been declared righteous through faith in Christ. What he's saying is, God hears the prayer of such a man. He listens to the prayer of such a person. Prayer is powerful and effective and effective weapons in the hands of the believer. And with the word powerful, he means that prayer have, has force. It's not impotent. It accomplishes things because it relies on God. Effective means to be active and energized, to be effective and at work. In other words, prayer is not a dead ritual. It's not counting beads. Prayer is speaking directly, personally, to our commander. What more do you want? You don't have to go through the corporal and then the sergeant and then the lieutenant and then the captain and then when it comes to the major, he just reports back and tells that guy to shut up. No! This is the wonder of prayer. This is why prayer is so effective. This is why prayer is so powerful. We speak directly, personally to our commander. So pray for one another. And the prayer of the, of the person who is Christ, the one who believes in Jesus Christ, is powerful and effective because he speaks to God himself. And he is all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all loving, he's all caring. Which is why the prayers of the believer are powerful and effective and accomplishing much. much. We, are, we are not praying in vain. On the one hand, James is telling us here with the words powerful and effective that this is the way that God makes us strong and effective again. If we are down on the battlefield and we need, some, and we need energy to stand up again, emotionally, spiritually, sometimes even physically. That God does this through prayer and in that sense prayer is strong and effective. But he's also telling us that prayer is not in vain. God works powerfully and effectively through our prayers. He lays people's names in our minds when we pray and we bring them before Him. In His providence, we remember certain situations or certain people when we pray. And God works our prayers in His will like that. And that's why James says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. It's not in vain. And I can see one of those early Christians sitting there in the back of the church and say, Ah, James, I don't have strong faith, you know. And James hears it and he says, What? Have you read of Elijah? You know what? Elijah was a man just like you. He was a human being. And he prayed, and look what happened. Verse 17. He prayed, and, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and it rained. <laughs> the Jews loved Elijah. And I think that's the reason why James picked him. Him, yeah. Apart from what we are going to discover about why he picked those prayers of him, particularly. But they still do. 
is one of the most popular figures of the Old Testament. Uh, for the Jews, Jewish tradition had it that Elijah had the reputation for prayer. Um, he was seen as a helper of the oppressed. They celebrated him for his miracles and his prophetic messages and his denunciation of sin. A real Old Testament superhero in the eyes of the Jews. But James quickly laid low that superhuman views of Elijah. He writes, he was a man like us. A human being with the same shortcomings, the same struggles, in the same trenches that you find yourself in. And his prayers were effective. He prayed earnestly. And God answered. What is he trying to tell you? Tell those people. <coughs> the same is true of your prayers. Because you are a human being just like Elijah. Relying on God's strength. On God's power. Through prayer. What, is refer what, what James is referring to here, we can read of in 1 Kings 17 and 18, God declared through Elijah that a drought would afflict the land as a means of punishing Ahab, King Ahab and Israel for their idolatry. Elijah prayed earnestly, he did not rain, he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the land produced its crop again. But here's an important question to ask. Why did James choose this illustration? To show the effectiveness and power of prayer. Why did he not choose Elijah's powerful Mount Carmel event? Where he called down fire from heaven. It was spectacular. Or the raising of the dead son of the widow. Why didn't he choose those examples? To prove the power and effectiveness of earnest prayer. Here's a wise suggestion. James wanted his readers to see an analogy between the beaten and dry soul. That soul in a season of drought brought back to health and life and fruitfulness again through prayer. He wants us to see that prayers from, from such lips and such a heart is indeed powerful and effective to heal and restore and produce spiritual fruit again. And here's the thing, there's a reason he tells us Elijah was a human being just like us. We have the same grace gift from God that Elijah had. So use it. Pray intensely, pray fervently for each other and God's work and will in our own lives and in the life of this church. Because it is through prayer that God sends rain from heaven to restore the soul in a period of drought. It is through earnest prayer that God gives new life to a weak soul. It is through fervent prayer that God energizes the weary. It is through the prayers of a righteous man that God brings the wounded soldier to back to full health again. Ready to do his will, like that one song goes, and produce God-glorifying fruit. Pray. Pray for each other. And please do not stop after one day. It can take three and a half years, like you did with Elijah. It can take a lifetime. Praying should happen all the time. Listen. Prayer is not a one-shot vaccine. And then you are immune to all the troubles of this world. No. Prayer is more like a vitamin that you have to take daily, all the time, to ensure vitality and strength in faith. So that we can endure in trials and times of difficulties. It's more like those vitamins that we take. And we do that personally, but we also do that corporately in the local church, where we do confess if we have sinned against another person, where we do pray for each other, and so apply these 
God-given vitamins in our faith lives and in our faith walk here on earth. May the Lord be with you. May He strengthen you in this. And may He really speak to your heart so that you don't want to do anything else but speak back to Him in prayer. Shall we go? Come to the Lord and speak to Him as a, as a church. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us this amazing gift of grace called prayer to speak to our Lord directly, personally, to bring our hearts to you, to open up our lives and ask you to, to speak into it through your word, to change our thinkings, to change our feelings so that we can be healthy believers in this life and strong believers in this life and not be tossed around by every wave that comes along. I pray, Lord, that you, by your grace you will do that in our local church as well. Help us to take note of this and see the importance of it and see your grace in these two means that you have given us to make sure that we are a healthy body of Christ. I ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus.